Thank you. And thank you for coming. We are now at the Mulheim Habsheim Airfield on the air show in 1988, 1988, just outside of Basel. Air France are eager to show up their latest Perkis. It's a brand new Airbus 320. And that plane is unique because it was the first commercial jet airliner to have fly by wire where uh, you don't have mechanic controls, but a computer actually flies the plane. And it has some great safety features, such as it keeps the, uh, the plane within reasonable realms, within its flight envelope, and protects the, the pilots from making mistakes. So they come in slowly at the edge of what the plane can perform at the high pitch and to show off these features. Then, over the runway, the captain, like Macbeth, sees a forest where there should be none. And they came in a little lower than planned, so they are at the height of the treetops. So he pushes the throttle forward, and he tries to make the cl plane climb even further. But the plane neither accelerates nor climbs, and they slam into the trees. All of the 130-something passengers on board survive the crash, but two children are caught and cannot get out of the seats and die in the fire, as well as a woman who uh, goes and tries to help them. My name is Lars Alberton. I'm a founder of a small data engineering startup. We do customized data pipelines as a service. We build and run and host pipelines for, for uh, our clients. We do so in sort of in a highly industrial and automized manner, something that our clients cannot do. Uh, so we call this data factory as a service. It's the way that we work is very much inspired by Toyota and Lean, and I'm absolutely obsessed with continuous improvement, and therefore, when other, late at night, when normal people go and, and watch uh, British crime or costume drama on TV, I watch people die in the air crash investigation documentary series to see how the, how the aviation industry learns from their mistakes. Ironically, I don't fly anymore. The last time I boarded an aircraft was five years ago, going home from, from Berlin buswards. Uh, so this is my transportation home, the Liegewagen. And I can highly recommend not flying. <laughs> And ground transportation is that I enjoy travel so much more since I, I uh, stopped hanging around in airports. As you probably have figured out, there will be air crashes in this uh, presentation. About a thousand people will die before the end of the presentation. So if you are concerned about this and you are afraid of, of flying, this might not be the best presentation for you. I promise I will not uh, be offended if anyone leaves the room. Uh, also remember that these cases that I'm showing are not representative. They are the worst of the worst of the worst of pilot performances and mechanical failures and so forth. So why bother speaking here at the data conference about aviation? The reason uh, is that uh, as our software and, and AI becomes more powerful, we, get, we as engineers get more and more responsibility for people's lives and for democracy and, and the general well-being of society and so forth. These are some milestones uh, that have happened. Uh, the, f the first one is the fir first time a software killed a person. Uh, it was in the 80s, and, and a cancer patient got a radiation overdose and, and died. And uh, Uber got historical by probably having the first case of, of an AI by mistake killing a person. And just a few weeks ago, there was a case of a, a chatbot nudging a person to commit suicide. The pictures up to the upper right are from the Rwanda genocide in 1994, where a radio station was used to coordinate the killing of, of, of Tutsi people. And uh, many years later, in the genocide in uh, the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar, they didn't need a radio station anymore, anymore because they had Facebook. And it was even better because they didn't need to broadcast in the open. They could like whisper individually crafted messages to each individual to make them nudge. Uh, nudge them into do terrible things. And as we speak, I believe that this dedicated, targeted whispering is happening to people all over the world that tell them on, uh, about solutions to the Jew problem or the trans problem or the immigration problem or whatever your favorite problem is. So we, burden, have a lot of more responsibility than we used to have. Unfortunately, we are not as mature as many other uh, industries. And even worse, we are frequently celebrating the companies that demonstrate the 
least responsibility and the most recklessness in, in the respect for, for other people. Some companies have even encoded it in their company principles. Now there's a comparison here of an of aviation incident uh, where nobody died, but yet there's a 200-page report of, of uh, what to learn from it and what to do differently. And if, if Facebook had been producing the same type of report where every time they contribute to something bad, we will have piles and piles and piles of reports. So we need to grow up. Otherwise, we will be regulated for good reasons. So how do we do that? Well, that's why we're here. Uh, my idea is that we learn from the best. And the list to the left is the total number of aviation incidents in the last five years. Uh, on average, about 270-something people die each year. That's one jet airline full, which sounds like a lot. But if you compare that with other industries, you realize that people die like flies all the time in lots of human activities, in construction and manufacturing, in, in en energy production and so forth. And aviation, in spite of having a very difficult circumstances, like with throwing people into tin cans, up in the air, through thunderstorms, and then down again, have managed to compare themselves like with uh, business support services and religious organizers in terms of, of statistics. Don't ask me what these religious organizers were up to. I'm as curious as you. Whereas if we, for example, could would take uh, construction or, or manufacturing and do the same kind of list, it would be even longer than the Microsoft Teams terms and conditions. So my goal for the presentation here today is not to, to, that we all should be ashamed or that we should do precisely what aviation does, uh, but to see what they do and try to learn and pick up pieces and maybe look at the pieces that we have and see how, whether we, we can use them more structurally or, or better or, or at least be conscious about how we use risk management and when we elect not to use it and so forth. So the incident at, at Hapsam Asha was a, was a case of violating the principle that uh, risk is probability times impact, which means that if the probability is high, the impact must be low. So flying a low altitude air sniff over an airfield is clearly a higher probability uh, maneuver, and therefore you cannot fill the, the uh, aircraft full with passengers that some of them ironically won the lottery to get the, a ticket on that particular uh, plane. And this is a, a principle that the you know, used to usually adhere to well. If, the, if you have high probability uh, constructions like fighter jets, you have various, you have parachutes and injection seats to lower the impact of something happening. And if you, in some cases, you need to take uh, jet airliners into test flight and push them on the limit and they raise the probability. So then you do it with few people on board and oversee and so forth in order to avoid uh, high impact incidents. We have this in IT as well. Uh, there's, a th there's a concept called arrow budget, for example, which means that if, you, if you're doing well during a month or a day or a week, whatever, then you have an opportunity to, try to raise the probability of problems and do some experiments because you have a lower impact because you're, you're very far from your SLAs. And we also have the infamous principle of not deploying things on Fridays, which is an example of higher impact, lower probability. We know now that this, it's even more efficient to try to reduce both impact and probability at the same time. For example, by doing smaller deployments all of the time, so that each is, is less risk, both in terms of probability and impact. In aviation, when there are things that are naturally high risk events, because they're both high probability and high impact, they apply a whole series of mitigations to bring them down. One of these high-risk things is a stall. And that happens when a machine either flies very slowly or at a high pitch or high angle of attack, or some combination thereof. And that's a dangerous situation because the, the, wing, the, the air is not flowing properly over the wings, so the wings lose lift and the airplane falls to the ground. So there are multiple different mitigations in place. There are warnings inside the cockpit. There is sound. There is light. There is the shake of the, of the uh, yoke. Uh, there is also 
to lower the in impact. There, there's training for, for all uh, pilots. You train in simulators, you train in real planes that you take to a stall and then try to, try to get out of it and so forth. And there are mechanisms like computers that keep the pilots from going into a stall. And this is what happened at ha Habsheim. The, the stall protection kicked in, so when the pilot pulled back the yoke, he uh, wasn't able to climb further because then it would have stalled and fallen to the ground. And the throttle didn't help because it was too late. It takes a few seconds for the, for the machines to rev or for the engines to rev up. In the Wright brothers built a wind tunnel long ago, and they figured out that the proper shape of the wing depends on the speed of the incoming air. And that's why we, in modern airplanes, we have flaps, things that move at, come out at the edge to shape, change the shape of the wing, and larger airplanes, not this one, also has slats on the leading edge of the wings coming out. Now, these are critical in order to fly at low speed, that they are used, uh, so it's important that they are activated before takeoff and before landing and so forth. And likewise, the, this is a high risk. There are multiple different types of mitigations. There, there is a technology that will prevent pilots from making mistakes. There are checklists so that they, uh, that they go through and and, uh, to configure the plane for takeoff and for landing and, and so forth. And the reason it's so important to have diverse mitigations, different types of mitigations, is that every time we apply a mitigation, we make some assumptions. So for example, it, one mitigation is to test things. And we can test that uh, engines still work even if, even if they strike a bird. And the way that they were tested was that frozen turkeys was, were thrown into the jet engines. Now, uh, it was discovered later that live birds damage the jet engines in a different way, and that's why a plane ended up in Hudson. So, invalid assumption. And likewise, the, uh, there is something called the reverse thruster, which is the air brakes that, go, that kicks in when you, when you land an airplane to, to brake on the runway. And that can potentially, by accident, be activated during flight. And that has been tested on low altitudes, but some poor plane uh, got a reverse thruster activated on a high altitude, and then the flight dynamics were different than the plane went down. So we have, in a couple of fields in IT, learned this. And in QA, for example, we no longer uh, depend only on a few types of quality assurance. We have a diverse set of different types of quality assurance that do different assumptions. Likewise, in security, we don't have the, the hard perimeter managed by the security team in the, in the squishy middle anymore. We have multiple lines of defense. In data, we are a bit behind here. Uh, we, are, we have few lines of defense and, uh, you know, from zero to two or something. So, so we still have some work to do here. I don't have any concrete suggestions at the moment, but this is something that we need to shape up with. In 19... 1979, a DC-10 taken off, lost one of its three engines. And then it banked over and crashed into the ground, killing everybody on board. This is one of the US uh, most severe uh, air accidents. And two unfortunate people on the ground died as well. So why did an engine fall off? The engine fell off because of money. Economy is unstoppable. That's a force that you cannot eventually uh, resist or put up resistance against. What had happened was that you need to take engines off of the, uh, of the airplane every once in a while to service them. And the manual said, take the engine off the pylon, which is the, the construction that holds the engine there. What American Airlines found out was that it was cheaper, or it was quicker and therefore cheaper, to take both of the engine and the pylon off, service the engine, and then put them back on again. Now, what happened was that they put them on with a forklift, and a forklift is not a precision instrument, and the, and the driver of the forklift couldn't actually see where the pylon uh, was going into the engine. So he missed a couple of times, and that happened on a regular basis, which, which, gave, uh, which, her, which dented the wing so that cracks started appearing. Since this was cheaper, it spread to the other airlines, and the cracks spread as well to the other airlines, so they found lots of cracks in, in various DC-10s. Now, if you cannot win against economy, you have to win at some other layer. Because if you decide to do something that is more expensive to, to sort of lower the risk, then eventually 
you have a very strong force of gravity bringing you back down to lower cost again. And we see this over and over again. What you can do is to sort of win at some meta layer and change the game so that the things you do to reduce risk also reduces cost. And when I say reduce cost, it can, it, it can also mean like reducing cost of delay or getting more value, whatever, something tied to economics. In IT, we, are, we use a lot of guardrails, right? things that enable us to move faster, but yes, yet have a lower risk. And it's like putting brakes on a car, right? We, it, if, if we have brakes on the good brakes in the car, then we can drive faster. It all, it's also safer, but more importantly, we can drive faster. So, since the State of DevOps report, we've figured out that the, many of the practices we had to do things more carefully, to, to be more risk averse and so forth, actually didn't work all that well. And that the, th the things that make us move faster, many of the things that make us move faster also reduce risk. So there is an opportunity to sort of win this game by, cha by changing the game. So we know why American Airlines 191 lost the engine, but why did it crash? And a, a, an airplane can have so much redundancy that they can fly with two out of three engines, even if it falls off. The, what happened was that you see this thing here, that's hydraulic fluid leaking out. So they lost uh, one of the hydro three hydraulic systems, right? There's but there's still so much redundancy in the airplane that they, that they can fly. Uh, but what happened then was that the slats on the leading edge were pushed in because the hydraulics no longer held them out, but only on the left wing here. So then what happened was a partial stall, meaning that the right wing here was still working as, as it should, but the left wing didn't generate as much lift, so it stalled. So it, the plane was lifted on the right side, but not on the left side, and started banking to the left. Now, if the pilots had known, they could just have added more thrust to bring up the speed, and then the left wing would cease stalling. But they didn't know, because the electrical systems were hurt, so the, the light and sound warnings didn't work, and likewise, the, the, the yoke shaker didn't work. And the, it's the case often in complex systems that when one component fails, it affects lots of things. It affects both multiple controls, but also multiple meters that the, that the pilots see to deduce what is wrong. So it can be difficult just from all of these meters to deduce which component is actually faulty. And there are, there's lots of redundancy in, in complex systems, which means that they can handle a faulty component, but it also means that every once in a while some components will be at fault. This confusion brought down Air France 441. It was lost over the Atlantic Ocean, and they found the, the flight recorders years later at about 3,000 meters deep, and then they figured out what happened. What happened was that the sensor got blocked by, because they flew through a thunderstorm and it clogged an airspeed sensor. Then the, Autopilot kicked out and said, you are not, not, not in normal law anymore where we protect you all the time. You are in alternate law where, where the computers do less and the pilots need to do more. And if they had just continued to flying straight, everything would have been fine. The complete problem is that there was complete dark outside, pitch black. So they don't, didn't know which direction was straight. Now, the, some of the gyros worked properly. So if they had just trusted the right instruments, everything would have been fine. Uh, but they didn't. One of the uh, pilots, the least experienced one, he started pitching up because he was afraid they were going too fast rather than too slow. So eventually they pitched up and the plane started stalling and dropping from the sky. Now what happened was that some sensors on the belly here of the plane, they only work properly if there's proper airflow. So when, this, when the plane was stalling, some more sensors started malfunctioning and confused the situation even more. But then the original sen problematic sensor, it thawed, and it started work pro uh, producing correct data. So the situation got quite confused. It was only very late, after a few minutes, when they were close to the ocean, that the, uh, the least experienced pilot who was at the helm said, uh, I've been pull pulling back all the time. 
And then the captain realized what had happened, uh, but then it was too late. It's a very chilling conversation to, to listen to. In order for pilots to figure out what has gone wrong, or when I say pilots, I mean the operator. Uh, and the operator, in some cases, is an AI, right? In the case of autopilots or in the case of, of the systems that we are building. In order for pilots or the operators to figure out what have gone wrong in the, in the case of a component fault, uh, they need the raw data, right? They need the raw metrics from each component so, they so that they have a chance of deducing that, well, this looks abnormal. If they only get the nice flight instruments, high level, where everything has been prepared and, and gently um, refined to make it easier for them, it's much harder to find out what, uh, what has gone wrong in the component fault. So that's why an Airbus cockpit, cockpit look like, looks like this. Tons of sensors showing uh, a very high bandwidth communication to, to the operators. Whereas a car cockpit looks like this, right? The difference is that in a car, if something goes wrong, you don't need to get the, get the car down on the ground because it's already on the ground, so you just you know, divert and go to your mechanic. Now, in order for the operators here in the middle, as I said, to deduce what has gone wrong or not, they need all of the gory details, all of the raw information. Now, we can reflect here on how we share data. Some of the paradigms say, yes, all of the data should be shared, and it's up to the consumers to decide what should be, uh, what should be used or not, most notably the, the sort of the data lake concept of sharing data, whereas some other concepts say, no, we shouldn't share the raw data. We should, the, uh, the producers should produce refined data that is easier to use and that has been clean and so forth, which works fine when uh, things are going fine, right? When nothing at fault, uh, is at fault. But in order for the operators or the AI in the middle to deduce what's, what's wrong, they need more information than that. This is another way to look at, uh, at systems we build, right? The, uh, you spend some cost, you get some benefit, and then there's a risk of things going wrong down there. And these two up here, they're known, right? But we never know how close to disaster you are until disaster actually happens. So the way to keep off here is, there, or there are two ways to keep off here. One is to learn when disaster happens, and one is to, to somehow get information that, that things might be going wrong. For example, when your components fail and act on it. Learning from disasters is built into the aviation industry, and the, these flight recorders have the sole purpose of getting better knowledge from disasters or near disasters. One of them records what the machine does. One of them records what the humans do and how they reason. We have flight data recorders as well, right? We log what the machines do, uh, and in order for when things go wrong to understand what went wrong, we need to log more than just the raw data, right? Uh, we need to log also intermediate data, machine decisions, and so forth, because the raw data is sufficient when everything is fine, but when things are not fine, then your assumptions will be invalid, uh, and, uh, and therefore you need intermediate data as well. We have some logging for, for what the uh, humans do as well. We have version control, and if, if we do everything as code, then lots of things are in version control, but there, there are some other loggings as well. And this is an example that happened uh, many years ago now, uh, when the Hadoop went down. And uh, it, it looked like it was a human operator error because suddenly the metadata was, was like deleted. And uh, so my manager, he, he, he took out the, the human flight recorder, right? And, and said, give me your batch history. And then he correlated time with the, the commands in time with the actual incident and figured out that it was a test, uh, test suite gone haywire. Like economy, we, we, which we cannot change. We cannot change human nature either. Human nature is also unstoppable. Meet Jacob Wald, Waldheisen van Zanten, as was difficult to pronounce. He had a great career at KLM. He flew the jumbo jets. Uh, he was chief of the flight academy. Uh, and everything went great. He was the, even the poster pilot until he came to own a very sad record because one day he found himself at Tenerife 
It was crowded with planes because of a bomb threat on, on Las Palmas. And there was fog and no ground radar, so the only way to know where the planes were was through communication with the, with the tower. And uh, at some point, he, he pushed his throttle to take off, and uh, the flight engineer said, are you sure that the Pan Am Jumbo is off the, off the runner? Yes, of course it is, he said, and dismissed the concern. And this is the worst uh, disaster in aviation history. A year later, a similar, in a way, similar incident happened when the landing gear uh, light failed to show whether the landing gear was, uh, was down or not. It was down all the time, but the captain got so focused on figuring out what to do with the landing gear and dismissed the concerns of his, uh, of his fellow crew members, and they ran out of fuel and crashed. So besides the burning engine, who can, who can see what the problem is in this picture? Raise your hand. Yes, you're right. It says we have some trouble with the right engine, but the left engine is on fire. And the passengers knew this, when, uh, ca that the captain had uh, shut down the wrong engine. The crew, cab cabin crew knew it, but the pilots didn't, because they can't see the engines. And nobody told the cockpit, so the plane went down. So in response to incidents like this, something called crew resource management was defined. And I can pick out a couple of central points here. One is that the structure of the crew resource management it is intent to use all the information available to the crew and all opinions, all the diverse p opinions. And uh, in order to do so, psychological safety is paramount. You need to be able to speak up when you have information, even though, though you're not the captain. And this includes the cabin crew. And another central point is that the necessary activities that need to keep the plane up and not crashing into things must be performed in that priority order. And I believe that there are similar uh, orders of, of, uh, or things that need, really need to be performed in other systems that we build as well, but they're use case specific, of course. In order to illustrate the culture barrels that some, sometimes have to be overcome, there's a there's uh, near incident from Korean Air where a, the captain was heading for a mountain. And the first officer realized, but he still didn't feel comfortable enough to speak up. So he said, what a beautiful landscape. And the captain looked up and stared away from the mountain. Problem solved. <laughs> Crew resource management has made its way outside of aviation, not so much to IT, at least not explicitly. Uh, but if you look at when Google a few years ago decided to figure out what sh what's the configuration for an optimal team, what is important, then the psychological safety got, uh, was paramount, m much, uh, much higher than, uh, than all the other priorities. And we can also see the getting the right things done here. So we, we can see some, some uh, common properties here. Now let's see if I, I can get that sound. <laughs> This is a ground proximity warning. This is what a Boeing aircraft says when the radar detects that you're going towards ground when you shouldn't be. Now, in some cases, this is inadvertently uh, kicked off. For example, when, when uh, planes are taxiing on the ground. And as you can tell you know, from my distraction here, it's quite annoying, isn't it? So therefore, a number of people a number of captains just turned it off when it wasn't working properly. Of course, at some, in some cases, at the cost of human life. Right? This is a false positive warning. We all know them too well. Right? So it's easy to sort of deviate a little bit. The problem is once you start to deviate a little bit, you enter something called normalization of deviance. Those like me who were born in the 70s might remember the Challenger accident, a piece of rubber. Uh, didn't hold, and the tank blew up, and the whole spaceship blew up. And the reason it didn't hold was that they were launching outside of the temperature specifications of that piece of rubber. It, and the, the Disaster Commission, they said that you have been slipping on these specifications, right? You used to launch only within specified temperatures, and then you moved further and further away from the specs. And if you do that, a disaster is inevitable. 
So this is a, a, a example of normalization of deviance. We see that in some, uh, some air disasters as well. This is in Venezuela. It's a really mountainous region, and they, the pilot treated their plane as you know, just riding a car. They, they came late. And, quickly through the checklist. If they had waited another 30 seconds for the navigation system to reset, they would have a good navigation system. Now they took off into clouds with a compass as the only navigational system. And then they didn't fly the normal route, but took a shortcut and slammed into a mountain. This is the worst uh, case that I know outside of Boston. This is a private jet. The private uh, jet pilot seems to be more uh, more eager to deviate from practices. So this is a, a, some kind of lock that sits here on the vertical stabilizer, and of course you need to move it, remove it before you take off. So then there are, it's part of ch several checklists. You should it's supposed to walk around the plane, and there's even a mechanical lock that prevents you from, from, uh, uh, from raising the thrust too high if it's still there. But if you uh, push strong enough, you can force it anyway. So they never got airborne, they just slammed right off of, of, of the runway. These are the worst of the worst of the worst, remember that, right? Do, pilots don't generally do this. We, of course, have lots of normalization of deviance, right? You, you've seen the, this is one of our clusters. I, you know, we're not better than this. We, clearly, uh, we don't regard an error in a Kubernetes cluster log as, as, a, as a real problem anymore. And, you can't win, right? You can't sit, sit, you can't sit down and say, oh, I'm going to take care of these 30,000 errors right now. That's pointless. So you need to find a meta layer where miti mitigating the risk is also seen as beneficial to her, whoever is doing it, right? If, if you go for the delta instead, for example, then the person uh, mitigating the risk will, will feel that, oh, OK, this told me not what there was, the thousands that were before, but the things that I did, the things that I contributed, so that I can learn. And I feel safer because I have a machine that tells me if I go wrong, so I can move faster, right? Aligning economy or speed with risk reduction. And if you can't manage to do it at that layer because cultural reasons or whatever, find another layer, right? Twist it around until, until you find a layer, meta layer where you can win. Some systems are naturally stable, meaning that even on their degraded, degraded performance, they perform reasonably well. I will show you what it is by showing it a not so naturally stable or a naturally unstable system. This is Stockholm 1993, the Stockholm Water Festival, where the, the Swedish Air Force wanted to show off the front well jet. Then disaster. Miraculously, no one was seriously hurt. A flash of fire and the pride of the Swedish Air Force had tumbled to the ground. Stunned spectators looked on as smoke billowed from the crash site. Another view of the crash showed the fighter. Watch the, watch the dynamics of the plane, how it's moving now. Tens of thousands of people watched as the plane stalled above them. You see how it's wobbling? Right? That's not how planes are supposed to move. I'm sorry. I, I, just to show you how lucky we were, nobody got hurt, right? Or nobody got seriously hurt. This fell down here in the woods. I used to live in this area. I lived in this area at the, at the moment, actually. Uh, and there were, the bridge here was full, crowded with people. So we could have had, you know, hundreds of people dead. But instead, someone got just a little hurt. Now, the reason that the plane moved this way is that it's naturally unstable. The force on, on that particular jet is applied behind the center of gravity. It's like pushing a ball with your finger. You always need to cor make corrective moves in order to push it where you want it to be. And if we ride a bike, then we as the humans make these corrective moves. But in, the, in the, uh, fighter jets like this, uh, it's a piece of software that makes it. And the software was faulty in this particular uh, case. They struck a bug, and then the plane went down. Now, in older jets, they are stable. And likewise, passenger airliners are typically stable. So even on the degraded performance, they f perform reasonably well. In this, this is an example here of an F-106, uh, which got into flat spin, 
So the pilot ejected, but that kick from the ejection seat turned out to be the thing that the plane needed to, to start flying again. So it started flying and it wobbled down and landed belly on its belly in, in the airfield and burned its jet fuel for another hour or so. Whereas modern unstable systems, they don't do that. We, have, we build stable and, ice and unstable systems in IT as well. And we had one incident at one point when a database got overloaded, and that might have been okay if it wasn't for the case that the system that didn't get a response tried more times. And when it failed up to the upstream system, that tried even more times. So when the database got slightly overloaded, we, it suddenly had a thousand increase in load, and it was really difficult to get out of this situation. This is a sample of an unstable system, right? As soon as it degrades a little bit, it just falls over and crashes. And in general, if we build, this is a push system. And if we build or integrate di distributed systems with push technology or push strategy, they will become naturally unstable. And we need to put active things in there, like circuit breakers or back pressure or something, to make them behave even under faulty conditions. Whereas if you build them on pools so that the, the the system on the right side is asking for more work when it's idle, then they become naturally stable. And uh, in data processing, like if we do processing with microservices or with uh, streaming uh, processing, it's typically push system, where batch systems are pool systems, and therefore uh, operationally much cheaper and naturally stable on the, on the degraded conditions. Now I will end by uh, telling you my favorite uh, air incident, and this is a, a jet airliner that ran out of fuel in the 80s. And uh, fuel is a single point of failure in airliners, and therefore there are lots of mitigations. And what happened here in the end was a confusion of imperial, imperial and metric units. And you can see the perfect storm that needed to happen in, all for, in order for all of these mitigations to, to sort of be uh, avoided. And this is something that we actually have a solution for in IT, right? It's called static typing. Except that we are very eager, even though we had good guardrails, we are kind of eager to throw them out of the window if we find a reason. So how many people in here do the primary data processing, most of the data processing in a statically typed language, like Java, Scala, C++? See, a small handful, but most of us have thrown this guardrail out of the windows, right? And are not protected for, from these types of errors. And we actually, in IT, have lots of these guardrails that are really good at both enabling us to keep, maintain a high speed and also reduce risk. Uh, but then something comes and distracts us and, and we throw them out. Either, you know, this uh, it's a very tempting Python library. We also use Python libraries. I'm no, be no better than the rest of you. Uh, or there we have people that know SQL, but they don't know other languages, so that's what we'll use and so forth. I don't want to tell you what to do here. I want you to make your decisions consciously and think of these things as God rays, right? It's not just typing, but how it's easy it is to test, how easy it is to monitor and so forth. I want to highlight one particular thing here that, it's, uh, that I find is often uh, not considered. Uh, if you have a, a situation where you're using something that can, that can induce bias, uh, such as in this case, uh, doing different things depending on the country or region of the, of, the, uh, of the application that you have at hand, then if you're in a high code environment, like Spark, Hadoop, whatever, it's usually really easy to add a little bit of, of monitor, quality monitoring here. Whereas if you go to a low-code environment, like SQL or graphical tools and so forth, this is much more difficult to do. And you can do it with another SQL statement, but you know, when you have 20 of these or 30 of these, those SQL statements tend to go, and, and in my opinion or in my experience, most people just don't. So please be conscious about the guard rays that you decide to do or drop. So what happened with the plane that ran out of fuel? Well, then the engine stopped. And then you have no electricity, no, air, no hydraulics, which makes the plane difficult to control. So therefore, a little piece of steampunk comes out at the bottom of the plane, a, a wind turbine that generates a bit of electricity and a little bit of hydraulic power to the systems, so they, it, the plane is controllable. So they found a, a, an airbase field where the, where the first officer did his military service, uh, and, they want to, and they tried to land on that field. Now, 
problems start piling up, right? The landing gears, you have to take them down manually, and they lock by gravity, except that the nose wheel doesn't lock. Due to the uh, decreased hydraulics, they don't have any flaps and slats, so they need to land really fast. But they're too high, so that they either will miss the runway or it, they will come down way too fast. So they can't do a 360 because that, that will take them too low. Now, this particular captain, he has superpowers, right? He is an experienced glider pilot, so he takes a trick that gliders sometimes do, but nobody has done in a jet airliner before or after. He banks to the left, which would make normally the plane turn to the left, but it then compensates with the rudder over here so that the plane goes sideways and a little bit with a vertical stabilizer. So the plane skids sideways towards the runway, and you can imagine the terror of the passengers. Like they have a 60-degree bank, and like this is your captain speaking. This is a planned maneuver. We will be landing shortly, so please Ray, put your seats in the upright position, and so forth. And when they come down, just before the runway, he, he straightens the plane and puts it down, only to discover that it's not an airfield anymore. It's a racetrack, right? And there are family picnics out there on the former airfield. And there are two kids on the runway, you know, with bikes, and they bike for their lives. They make it. And uh, the nose wheel, fortunately, is not locked in locked position. So it goes, the nose goes down, and the increased friction of the nose belly against the, the uh, runway makes them stop before the crowd at the end of the runway. So nobody was hurt from touching down. A few, few people were hurt from jumping out the slides. And then lots of people at the races, which all have fire extinguishers, rushed out, rushed out to help. The uh, pilots were first uh, reprimanded for letting this happen, and then eventually they got medals for their airmanship. They put, uh, they put lots of flight crews in the simulators in the same situation. Nobody else made it to the runway. So with that little story, I leave these here. These are my, I believe, the main points that I figured out from looking at aviation. I'll just leave them there, and thank you for your time. <laughs>